Pulsar is the idea whose time has come. Pulsar, the solid-state time computer no larger than a wristwatch, has been called the first completely new way to tell time in 500 years. Press a button and Pulsar tells you the time in lighted numerals on a ruby-red time screen. Accurate to within 60 seconds a year, Pulsar, the time computer, has no moving parts, nothing to wear out, wind up, or run down. Pulsar needs no routine maintenance, oiling, or cleaning. The new two-button Pulsar date command tells you the date as well as the time. Its calendar has a high IQ, knows the difference between a 30 and 31 day month, and makes the change automatically. This is Risk Rent. And of course I'm not featuring a $700 watch on this channel, even if I'd love to. I just can't afford to spend that much on what now is more of a novelty rather than something actually practical or groundbreaking at the least. But for just a little over 30, this Griffey is one very affordable nod to one of the most definitive milestones in time-telling history. I was just so thrilled to come across a few vintage Pulsar commercials in my research that I had to play one for the intro. But more to my excitement, I guess that ad pretty much gives an idea of what the Pulsar or 1970s LED watches in general presented the world back then. A revolutionary wrist computer with an unheard of level of timekeeping accuracy that had no moving parts to eventually wear down, that required absolutely no maintenance or servicing, and displayed the date based on a calendar that was so intelligent to differentiate between months with 30 or 31 days. It may seem ridiculous now, but those features were indeed once radically new. But most of all, the Pulsar was the world's very first digital watch. Well, first electronic digital watch to be more precise, cause these came as early as the 1920s. It simply was space age technology back in the 70s. Most historians even claim that the innovation it brought forth was the greatest since the invention of the hairspring. I agree. And in my opinion, we won't get to this without that Hamilton debut in 1972. Of course, we can't ignore Seiko's role in this revolution with its release of the Astron in 1969 as the world's first commercially available quartz timepiece. But it was that leap with LED technology that made the Pulsar the biggest thing in its time, a celebrity, outselling every other major brand in the market despite being priced higher than a top-of-the-line Rolex. In fact, it was the first watch to be imported into Switzerland. It simply was America's biggest success story in the world of horology. But more important than those achievements, the Pulsar's birth was the leap that started all the little steps toward the future of timepieces. All the big companies such as Seiko, Casio, Citizen, Armitron, Timex, Orient, even the Swiss giants like Tissot, Younghans, Omega, and Rolex would all take part in this march trying to offer the market more and more useful exploits of that technology with every single release. No longer were watches delegated time-telling tools but wearable computers promising an infinite possibility of applications. If money weren't a concern, the recent Hamilton reissue would have been in my collection since its release. Of course, this Griffey wouldn't stack up against the PSR in quality but it ain't a cheap homage to that watch nor the vintage Pulsar either. This actually is a remake of the brand's very own LED watch from the 1970s. And yes, Armitron was in fact one of those companies that pioneered the digital revolution. That history alone sets the value of this watch way above the $30 price tag in my opinion. But is it actually good enough as it is? Let's find out. By the way, if you find these reviews interesting, it would really help the channel if you could hit that like button and perhaps consider subscribing. And here's the watch taken out of Armitron's standard tin case. Nothing impressive, but it obviously does a better job than those cardboard boxes that most basic Casio ship in. Let's get some specifications out of the way. I got 35mm across the widest side of the case against the stated 34. Exactly 40mm from lug tip to lug tip, that would be 37 on the product page. 9.8mm from the case back to the top of that slightly raised acrylic crystal against 9. And a somewhat disappointing 16mm lug width and not 18 as written here. With those inconsistencies, I don't think I'd be confident to trust this claimed water resistance of 50 meters. Here this with an F91 for size comparison and on my 6 and a quarter inch wrist for more reference. 
I honestly think the dimensions are perfect but really wish it took standard 18mm straps. This is the bracelet that it came with, stainless steel with rolled links. Almost identical to that on most entry level Casios. Quite comfortable on the wrist but far from nice as we all know. And I really love the mesh that came with my Rubik and was actually excited of fitting it on this Griffey too. But other than that, I honestly like how this looks on my wrist. I see it as a hippie alternative to the most favored watch in my collection. Now let's head on to the functions. Not really much to say here. Press this button once to display the time. One more for the date. And another time for a ticking seconds counter. It's a basic 7 segment display that stays lit up for around 5 seconds from each press of a button. This pusher right here is the settings button. Hold it down for about 2 seconds to get into adjustment mode. Then every single press advances you through 12 or 24 hour display formats. Hours, minutes, seconds, year, month, date, then back to the main screen. Adjustments to any active field are keyed in with every press of the top button. Legibility as you'd expect is unbeatable indoors and actually more usable under hard sunlight than I was expecting. I'm not sure if that would be the case for the other variants that had the red or blue LEDs but those extra large digits certainly help a lot here. Now on to the case finishing. I purposely reserved this part toward the end because this is where my main gripes are. Horizontal brushing on the sides, longitudinal on top, with high polished chamfers on either side. If you can see this, these strokes on top run at a slight angle from top to bottom. Then, taking a closer look at the lug openings, you'll easily notice the imperfection in these cutaways forming a really crooked line as it meets the sloping top side of the case. Same goes for the other side. Well, I just got this for $31 so would it be unreasonable to expect more for that money? Maybe, but I really had nothing bad to say about my Rubik so I guess that could have raised my expectations for the brand a little bit. The Griffey can be had for $60 directly from Armitron's website. With these units selling for half that price on Amazon Deep Manufacturing Rejects, I just couldn't help entertaining that probability and would love to hear your thoughts on the comment section below. I could have been perfectly happy with this Armitron if not for the careless finishing. I actually got one in for fun but ended up really liking this type of watch a lot that I'll be putting this Griffey up for sale after the review and move up a tier as soon as I find a good deal on either of these. Would very much appreciate if you could share your hands-on experience with either watch or maybe some suggestions for a better alternative. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.